drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, by what you're looking for.
Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath Till I die. 
All right, praise the Lord. It's a privilege to be here to preach to actual people. Uh, Even though there's not a lot of people here today, there are some. Uh, I don't know if you realize what your preacher goes through staring at a camera and not having actual people. It's uh, it's a real challenge. Um, I'm reminded of a story of an old preacher who went, who's a missionary, and he went to preach to a church hundreds of years ago, I think it was 100, 200 years ago, something like that. Whenever David Livingston was a missionary, about 40 years before that, 30 years before that, or something like that. But anyways, he, um, he preached and he went to win these people to the Lord to go to Africa. And so his whole heart was to win young people to the Lord and win strong men to the Lord to Africa because it was hostile and most of them wouldn't make it back and it would just be such a, such a hard journey. And when he went to preach to this church, it was a snowstorm, and the only ones there was little old ladies. But he preached that message faithfully anyway. What he didn't know was there's a little boy working on the organs. Who I believe, if my, my memory is correct, was late David Livingston. And he heard the call, and he surrendered to Africa. That man just preached faithfully. And, and so that's, that's our whole heart as, as a pastor, as a preacher for me, is to just be a, a man who preaches the word faithfully and, and trust God to do what he does from it. So I don't know why I said that, but I did. It's not in my notes, I promise. But um, it's good to be here with you today. Uh, the title of the message is The Good News and the Bad News. The Good News and the Bad News. And we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 43. Uh, pastor Jeremy asked me to work with him on preaching a series of messages uh, focused on restarting and getting back together again, whatever the new normal is, guys. Uh, so, so I'm excited. I built this sermon for this purpose. Um, God just laid it on my heart as I searched the Bible and prayed through it. And so I hope it blesses you as it did me to build it. So if you would stand, if you can, if you want to, to honor God's word, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 14. <laughs> I said 16, I'm sorry, it's 14, through 21. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness, in rivers in the deserts. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts to give drink to my people, my chosen. This my people, this people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. Let's bow together and pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege, the responsibility to be a preacher of the gospel. I have nothing to boast at or on this morning. Father, I'm a a man who's frail and weak. I have nothing to boast in. I'm 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 a fool to this world. But God, you've allowed me to be here this morning, and I want to do a good job. 
So I pray that I'd be able to stay out of the way and depend solely on you. I pray that your word, Lord, would take effect this morning through the live feed and through, through our brothers and sisters who are here this morning, through me and in me. God, would you, would you encourage your church this morning that there is always good news and the bad news for believers in Jesus Christ. Father, we have the promises of God. We are your chosen called people. So I pray, God, that we would act like it and you would just bring a fresh revival to your people this morning as we're encouraged through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. So let's just kind of walk through the context this morning. So we have Assyria or Nineveh. You guys know who Nineveh is. Nineveh, Assyria, a superpower. This is a superpower in the land, crushing nations under its thumb. The nation of Assyria uh, defeated most of the cities in Judah, and now the nation of Assyria was at the walls of Jerusalem, threatening the nation. You look at the context back in Isaiah 36, and you've got the leader, you've got one of the captains of the Assyrian army, and he is standing at the walls, and he's hollering out at the, at the people at the walls. He's he's, deleg- he's talking to the de- to the guy, delegating back and forth. And and Assyria spoke in uh, they did not speak in Hebrew, but they spoke in Aramaic. But this man is speaking in Hebrew, so all the people in the wall can hear it. And the guy's saying, "Please don't speak in Hebrew. Speak in Aramaic." And he's like, "No." And he begins to taunt them, and he begins to threaten them. And Assyria could crush Jerusalem. Threatening, threatening Jerusalem, and Hezekiah is the king, and Hezekiah turns to God in ashes and sackcloth, and God says, I will deliver you. And he, the angel of the Lord slays 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. How would you respond to that? How did Hezekiah respond to that? Hezekiah should have said, this nation will fast and pray. This nation will, will put sackcloth and ashes on. Don't even feed your donkey. Like we are going to seek God and praise God now for what he's done. His faith and his faithfulness to God should have been at an all-time high, but what happened? Hezekiah, he gets sick. And, and, and in, in his sickness, he, Isaiah comes and says, you're going to die. I'm pretty sure it was Isaiah. He, he said, you're going to die. And Hezekiah turned to God, and he pleads to God, and guess what God does? Gives him 15 more years of life. Heals him. The king of Babylon heard, heard, heard Isaiah was sick, sent, sent a message to Isaiah, or excuse me, Hezekiah was sick, sent a message to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is healed. What does Hezekiah do? He brings this Gentile into, his, into the castle. He, he, lets, he lets him see all the treasuries. Because he thinks he can make a deal with Babylon and defeat Assyria when God already said he was going to take care of things. That was the final straw. Because of Hezekiah's leadership, God delivered Jerusalem into the hands of Babylon. The protection's gone, the defense is gone, and the discipline's coming. That's the bad news. That's the bad news. <laughs> Not only is the nation in trouble because of leadership, but the nation is in trouble because God's people had walked away from God. God's people did not want to hear God's word. God's people didn't want the seers to see or the prophets to prophesy. It says in Isaiah that God's people wanted to hear smooth things. Isaiah 30 verse 9, for they are rebellious people, lying children, unwilling to hear instructions from the Lord who say to the seers, don't see, to the prophets, don't prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things and illusions. After all of the favor God showed these people, they rejected him. Hezekiah was healed, delivered, protected, and instead of finding security in his God, he found security in schemes, in the nation of Babylon. Have you ever heard somebody say, I've got good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? Right? Today, Isaiah has bad news, but good news. 
in the bad news. Isaiah is preaching God's word. He lets Hezekiah know that, that his sons, who should have been kings, will now be eunuchs in Babylon. I don't know if you know what they did to eunuchs. I won't go into that. But they weren't going to have kids. It was over. Isaiah lets the people know that they're going to be taken into exile now. Bad news. They'll be captives. The good news is that God will deliver them from exile. The good news is God will have mercy on them in the end. The good news is God will not leave them in discipline, but he will bring them back. And he will perform another exodus. Look at chapter 43, verse 16 and 17. He says, thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who will bring forth the chariot, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together and shall not rise. They are extinguished like a, they are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. What is he saying? God is saying this very simply. He is saying that Babylon's in his hands. He's saying that Babylon is his puppet. Assyria is his puppet. He's in control of our enemies even. That God is not surprised by what's going on. That No, Assyria, even though God is using them to discipline his people, he'll punish them for what they do. He's sovereign. He's in control. Man, that's good news. I'm reminded while reading this book of the grace of God. God in his anger remembers mercy for us. How is it that God can continue to forgive and deliver such stubborn people as you and me and these people that don't deserve it? Please don't think for a second that you deserve God's grace. Please don't think for a second that you're better than a lost person. God saved you. He called you. He chose you. You came under conviction and responded to that conviction. God blessed you, but you don't deserve it, and I don't deserve it. That's the grace of God. I don't understand it. (laughs) It's a mystery. If anyone tells you they understand the sovereignty and the grace of God and salvation from God, they are lying. It is a mystery. So what's the good news for the church today and And we can apply this truth to our life. I believe that. The good news is God did it before he can do it again. Man, that's good news. The bad news is you're going into exile. The good news is God did it before he'll do it again. He's going to bring you out of captivity is what he's telling the people. Imagine Hezekiah. He's sitting on the throne. He's thinking about the situation. He's sure to die. God delivers him. God heals him. The Bible says he gets 15 more years of life. He turns to God in prayer. God answers his prayer. That's in Isaiah 38. Then the enemy comes. The enemy's more stronger than him right before that. And he's at the walls taunting him. He's saying, your God can't deliver you. The gods of the Egypts, Egyptians didn't deliver them. These other nations didn't deliver them. But matter of fact, if you surrender to Assyria now, we'll give you horses and land and we'll take care of you. Just leave the city. Come with us. God promised to take care of the enemy, and God defeated the enemy. Hezekiah witnessed everything. And how did he he respond to that? He trusted in Babylon for protection. All of a sudden, Hezekiah got amnesia and forgot what God has already done in the past. I thought to myself, what would I say if I could jump in history? And talk to Hezekiah at that moment in time. Do you ever think that way when you read the Bible? What if I could just jump in there and just tell him something right now? I would say, Hezekiah, God has delivered you before. He'll deliver you again. Hezekiah, God saved you before. God will save you again. Hezekiah, God made a way before. He'll make a way again. Hezekiah, stop trusting in men, governments, and even yourself to do what only God can do. Right now, there are people in this church and in churches all over the world that are trusting in doctors instead of God. They're trusting in fake news instead of the good news. 
They're trusting in face masks instead of the Holy Spirit of God. They're trusting in home remedies and everything else. But God who will deliver, yes, I'm not saying don't go to doctors. I'm not saying don't wear face masks. I'm not saying don't wear gloves. I'm not saying that. But listen, don't trust those things more than you trust your God. Have you forgotten what God has done in the past? He can do it again. I'm talking about your past. What's he done for you? Do you remember? Man, God is bigger than the COVID-19 virus. God is bigger than addiction. God is bigger than a stay-at-home order. God is bigger than your relationship issues. God is bigger than, 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 the, than, the, than the city ordinances. God is bigger than this church building. We don't need the walls of the church to be the church, friends. And I'm just, I'm being honest, this may get me in trouble, but that's who our God is. He does what he wants. He does a new thing. He does it his way. Listen, just because we get quarantined doesn't mean our Christianity has to be quarantined. He mentions making a way and defeating the enemy before the mighty army, verse 16 and 17. What do you think they thought when he said he brings them down? He makes a way in the sea. Man, they had feasts and they had celebrations and they had, they had certain times of the year where they would have festivals and, and all these meals and these certain ceremonies they would do. Why would they do those things? Just to remember who God is and what he's done. Those meals represented a time when God delivered the people. Those, those, those times, the, the, the feast of the booths when they were, and then all these different things, the way they would dress and then not eating any leaven would remind them that they had to leave in a hurry because God delivered them before. He said, don't you remember what God has done? Man. Just because things get tough and change doesn't change the fact that our God is unchangeable. He is still the healer. He's still the healer. He's still the provider. He's still the redeemer. He's still the rescuer. He is the way maker. That's who he is. And here's just some homework for somebody tonight, today. Make a list of the victories God has accomplished in your life. Start celebrating them. The big ones and the small ones. (laughs) Testify. Tell people what God has done. Man, it would do somebody good. It would do me good even to start celebrating those those victories. Somehow we get amnesia and we forget what God has done in the past because of current situations. That's who we are. We're rebellious, stubborn people. Don't miss this. The struggle is just a season. It's a season. No matter how hard the season is, we need to be giving God glory, church. Did God rescue your marriage? (laughs) Celebrate that. Did God free you from addiction? Celebrate that. Did he rescue you? Did he rescue your health? Did he heal you? Did he pull you from the pit? Have you forgotten the victories? Man, I got to just say this. Listen, I'm not a prisoner anymore. I'm not a drug addict anymore. I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I'm not hopeless anymore. I'm not sitting in a prison cell wondering where I'm going to live anymore. No, God has delivered me, saved me, raised me up, given me a life to live, man. I can't let current situations stop me from celebrating those things and remembering if he did it before, he will do it again. Hezekiah, don't turn your back on the one who did it before because he can do it again. He's God. That's good news. No matter what the bad news is, that's good news. And the the other thing I see is, here's some good news and the bad news tonight, today. I don't know why I keep saying that. God's not done yet. God's not done yet. Isaiah gives them all the bad news, and and Isaiah's letting them know, hey, you're going to suffer. That's a promise. That's bad news. You're going to be taken captive. You're going to be dragged from your homes. But God's not done yet. Though you're going to have a season of suffering and hardship, God's not done yet. Though things will get rough, God's not done yet. Though discouragements will come, God's not done yet. Though life will never be the same, God's not done yet. Somebody look to the neighbor and say, God's not done yet. God is not done yet. He's going to do a new thing. I love that verse, verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. How exciting is that? 
Even though there's bad news everywhere we look, for the believer in Christ, there is always good news. It is a great time to be a Christian, First Baptist Church. A great time. We need to be the most positive, confident people in the city. As Christian people, has God stopped delivering? No. He keeps on delivering. Listen, he's going to deliver. He's going to continue to deliver today. He's going to continue to deliver tomorrow because that's who he is. Has God stopped making a way? No. He's the way maker. He's going to do it again and again and again because that's who he is. Has God stopped redeeming, rescuing, saving, freeing, defending? Some of us act like God has stopped doing this. God's hand's not tied. Man, he's, he's not done yet. To this people, this message during the reign of Hezekiah, he, he's given the message and he delivered the captives before Hezekiah. He's going to do it again. He defeated the enemies before Hezekiah. He's going to do it again. He made a way before. He'll make a way again because he is not done yet. I ask myself, why would God be so faithful to an unfaithful people? You ever ask yourself that question? Man, I've had a rough week. Somebody's saying to me today, my prayer life's in the dirt, man. Why is God still so faithful to me? (laughs) I've lost my patience with my, my kids at home this week. Why is God so patient with me? Why is he still blessing me? I'm going to tell you why, and somebody might get mad at me for this, but that's okay. Because God made a covenant, and he cannot lie. Verse 21, this people I have formed for myself. Friends, God's not faithful to you because you're faithful to him. Somebody doesn't like that statement. God is not faithful to you because you're faithful to him. Yes, God blesses obedience. God stands against disobedience. That's not what I'm saying. He is faithful to you because he called you, he chose you, he saved you, and he made promises to you in his word, and he cannot lie. Today, hold God at his word. Hold God at his promises. Claim God's promises. Pray God's promises back to God. Trust in God's word, not because you're faithful, but because God is faithful regardless of your faithfulness. Listen, I've read the end of the book. I know what happens, and it doesn't change because of my faithfulness. (laughs) God doesn't stop being God, the unchangeable, immutable God, because of me. That would make him unholy, not holy. He is different and separate from anything else. That's who he is. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It makes me weep like a baby because I can't believe that he is so faithful to me, regardless of my faithfulness to him, that he still loves me and he still has his grace for me and I still have a heaven as my home. I'm not working my salvation here. I'm living it out, being sanctified by God. But when I mess up and I do stupid things, God is still faithful. You say, where's the verse at for that theology, John? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, something I hold on to. The Bible says this very clearly, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That's a powerful, powerful verse. Powerful verse. If you have a works-based salvation, that verse just puts you in the dust. If we remain faithful, we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. What's my motivation What's my safety net? What happens when my safety net is gone? What happens when I suffer? What happens when hardship comes? God promises hardships. God promises suffering. That's bad news. God promises his people will die, that we will have loss, we will have pain, that some of us will be killed for his glory. That's God's word. My motivation cannot be the lack of suffering, the lack of hardships, the lack of death, the lack of loss, the lack of pain, the lack of none of that. My motivation has to be one thing, the faithfulness of God. God is faithful regardless of me. That is my motivation. I have a faithful, holy, merciful, sovereign, all-knowing, immutable God that cannot lie. 
That's my faithfulness. That's my motivation today. It's him, his word. My motivation must be God's faithfulness over everything I endure in my life. That's how you have a victorious Christian walk. You claim his word. Hold on to his promises, even though they're past your understanding and you don't get it. God's not like you. And he's not like me. He's holy, different. The things God's done in the past is solid evidence God could do it again. But I don't live in the past. I can't live in those victories because God's going to do a new thing. Man, I want to be a part of that new thing. I want to be a part of the new delivering and the new saving and the new working and all the new things God is going to continue to do, guys. He's not stopped that. He's still the rescuer, guys. Please listen to me. God will finish what he starts. That is good news. God will finish what he starts. The big question is this, can God be stopped? Why are we on this conspiracy theory stuff everywhere, guys? Why are we running around trying to figure this and that out when we have this? We should be standing on the promises of God's word. Can God be stopped? Let's see what it says. No, he can't be stopped. Can anything hold God back? Does God have one problem today? Is God in a hurry? Oh, he's late. No. Is God running behind? Is God, is he surprised? Does he have a problem? No. <laughs> have you read the book? Watch how it ends. It's going to be the same no matter what happens right now. That's who he is. There's no opposition for God. There's no nation out of his control. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, uh, they're all in his hands. The whole world, as the old song says, there's no disease God cannot cure. Some of us act like God has left the building because we can't meet in the building. I'm just going to say this, and this, this can give me some real trouble, but God's bigger than a church building. Don't let these four walls hold you back. Just because we can't come and meet here doesn't mean that God has stopped. The house church was the very beginning, how God, God moved through those house churches in the book of Acts. Guys, we need to be aggressive for the gospel right now more than ever. Christianity is not stuck in the church building. The Red Sea didn't stop God. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 16, thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. That's who he is, guys. Hostile people won't stop God. Isaiah 43, 17, who brings forth the chariot and the horses, the army and the warrior? They lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. God is basically saying, I'm using Babylon as a, as a discipline for you. I'm in control of them. I'm in control of their leader like I was in control of the Pharaoh. And they're going to get you, and they're going to take you, and then I'm going to get you back, and I'm going to discipline them for what they did. That's basically what he's saying. Everything is in his control. Christian people, we should be the most confident of all people on the planet because God will finish what he started. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a work in you will complete it. It's all him until the day of Jesus Christ. What do we do in the midst of a pandemic? What do we do in the midst of madness and running to and fro, everybody around us, everything falling apart, we praise God. We glorify God. We witness for the Lord until he chooses to call us home. God has a plan that cannot be stopped, and for those who belong to him, we can always rejoice in the bad news. We can rejoice in sufferings and uncertainties and hardships and pandemics and times of wonders. We can look to the Bible for the promises of God and we can know that God will finish what he starts. We are the people of God. For us, there will always be good news in the bad news. I love what, Ze what Zechariah says, full of the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 1, verse 67. You guys, you can make this your prayer. You could pray to him. You could, you could claim this. for. You could talk to God through the scripture. 
Back to him, get in your prayer closet and read this before you pray. Luke, Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Luke, Isaiah, that's not even, a, that's not going to happen. Luke chapter 1, verse 67, it, it speaks of uh, Zacharias. Uh, it says this, now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, look at this, guys. This is, this is our life. This is what we need to, we need to be like this. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us. You know who that is? That's Jesus. In the house of his servant David, he spoke as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began. What should we do? Listen, guys, this is it right here for you and me today. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to, be, to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore, he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Serve him how? In holiness and in righteousness all the days of our lives. Guys, I would encourage you to read that verse every day this week. Say, that is my life. That is my calling. The good news and the bad news is what? He did it before he can do it again. The good news and the bad news is God is not done yet. The good news and the bad news is this, guys. He will finish what he started. We can be confident today. We can praise the Lord because he is who he says he is in his word. We're going to have one song and there, there ain't a lot of people here, but maybe you want to pray. Maybe you want to hit the altar. Jeremy didn't tell me we couldn't do that, so I'm going to invite you to if you want. Maybe you're at home and you're watching, and you can just, you don't need my permission to pray. God's on you and convicting you and drawing you and calling you, whatever it is, through his word. I would encourage you to respond to that. Father, we thank you, Lord, that there is good news in the bad news that you are so faithful, God. And I ask that you forgive me for my lack of faith. I pray that you forgive me for my struggles as my Christian walk, Lord. I'm just confessing that to you, my struggle in prayer, my struggle in confidence in you, Lord, and pride. And I pray that we would be the most confident people. I pray that the church of First Baptist would experience a great revival, claiming those promises in Isaiah 43, claiming those promises in Luke chapter 1, holding you at your word, holding you at your covenant, trusting you in prayer. So God, would you do what no man can do? Would you bring a fresh wind of revival to this church and to my life? And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
joining us today. Again, be in prayer this week as we uh, approach next Sunday, our restart Sunday 1.0. Be in prayer that things just continue to move forward. Continue to watch for Brother Jeremy's updates and have a wonderful day.